Welcome back tonight. Those of you that were away yesterday, we had no meeting yesterday, so we welcome you back. Those of you that are watching, a welcome to you. Those of you here in this venue, as you came in, you should have got a topic outline. I don't know if you were handed this. This is the rest of our topics. Seminar is going right on for another two weeks or so. So you know now what the topics are coming up. Also, if you'd like a visit, you can put on the back of your quiz card, I'd like a visit. Put your phone number there. We, I generally come early, so if you'd like to visit here, I can visit with you here if you have questions. If you'd like someone to come to your home and visit you at home, we can do that. So just put that on your quiz card if you like. Let's do our quiz from the last lecture. This was Sunday night. Does everybody have a quiz card? Anyone need one of our quiz cards? If you're watching, then you can do the quiz on a blank piece of paper. If you're at another venue, then hopefully at the venue you have quiz cards there. Question number one is a review. The Bible says three things, three primary things are the truth. Name two of the three. The Bible says three primary things are the truth. Name two of the three. Truth was? Hmm? Hmm? Hmm. Write down the answers. Three things that the Bible tells us are the truth. Now, if you weren't here, well, I guess you'll have to guess. Question number two is a bit easier. Yes or no, so you have a chance. According to the New Testament, is Sunday or the first day ever said to be holy? Or was it ever kept holy by Jesus or his disciples? Put down on line two, yes or no. According to the New Testament, is Sunday or the first day ever said to be holy? Or was it ever kept holy by Jesus or his disciples? Question number three, true or false? When considering Bible truth, the safest thing to do is follow the crowd since the majority are always right. Question number three, true or false, when considering Bible truth, the safest thing to do is follow the crowd, since the majority are always right. Question number four, true or false, Sunday as a sacred day is a man-made tradition and began with pagan sun worship in Babylon. Sunday as a sacred day is a man-made tradition and began with pagan sun worship in Babylon, true or false. Final question, true or false? The Sabbath is a special appointment with Jesus, a time of fellowship, worship, blessing, and rest. True or false? The Sabbath is a special appointment with Jesus, a time of fellowship, worship, blessing, and rest. Are you ready to go back through and grade your quiz? I hope you got them all. I hope you got them all right. Let's go back through. Number one is the review. The Bible says three primary things are the truth. What were those three things? Jesus, the Word, and the Law. Well, I guess if you got all three, then you can give yourself a bonus point. There are the three. Jesus, the Word, or the Bible, and the Law. Number two, according to the New Testament, is Sunday or the first day of the first day ever said to be holy, or was it ever kept holy by Jesus or the disciples? The answer, unfortunately, is no. That's a tradition. Number three, when considering Bible truth, the safest thing to do is follow the crowd, since the majority are always right. That's false. Generally, the crowd is wrong. So if you follow the crowd, you're probably going the wrong way. Number four, Sunday as a sacred day is a man-made tradition 
and began with pagan sun worship in Babylon? What's the answer? That is true. Number five, the Sabbath is a special appointment with Jesus, a time of fellowship, worship, blessing, and rest. What's the answer? That is true. How many got 100% on the quiz? Oh, looks like about a third of you did. Maybe that first one was the one that stumped you. Three things that are the truth. Well, we're going to sing this song as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your score, your questions, your prayer requests. If you're watching in some other venue, hopefully they'll collect the quiz cards from you. And while they collect those cards, we're going to sing, Lift Up the Trumpet. If you know the song, sing with us. If not, we're going to learn a new song tonight. Lift up the trumpet and Lord, let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Now you know the tune. Sing with us. Echoing hilltops, proclaim it, ye plains. Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. is coming again. Tempest and whirlwinds, the anthem prolong. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming You believe that? Yes. Amen? Amen. 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 I like that song because of the theme. Jesus is coming again. That's the hope of the Bible believing person. Well, as you came in, you probably dropped off your ticket to verify you were here. Today is number nine. Our next meeting tomorrow night is number 10. You come to 15 lectures, you get to keep a Bible. And if you forgot to bring your ticket book, then you can write down your name on a post-it note. This is the Bible we're going to be giving you after you come to 15 lectures. And then we've also been giving out here the Bible lessons. Now, I wanted to mention, if you want to do the summary sheet, let me just underscore that point tonight. The back of every lesson, it has quiz questions. And you notice that each one of the quiz question, it has a number beside it. Number one says, at his second coming, and then it has a, a one in parenthesis. That means there's one correct answer. So of the multiple choice, you have one correct answer for number one. Christ will arrive privately and visit certain cities of the earth. Christ will appear in the desert. Christ will remain in the clouds and call the righteous up to meet, meet him in the air. So one of those three is the correct one. So you mark the correct one. And then, of course, you go to number two. And some of these will have more than one right answer. Like, for example, number six, it has four here in the parenthesis. That means there are four correct answers. So you mark the four. Then put your name somewhere on this quiz sheet. You can tear it off. Drop it off at the table the next lecture when you come back, when you've done it. They'll check it, grade it, and then the next meeting you can pick it back up. If you get all the quiz sheets done, then you'll get a diploma at the end of our seminar.
If you have questions about that, ask me. I can explain that to you in more detail. Tomorrow night, our topic is the Antichrist cover-up, and there is a cover-up relating to the Antichrist. We're going to look at that tomorrow evening. Thursday is no meeting here in this venue. Friday, our topic will be the Bible's longest, most amazing prophecy. Then Saturday, we actually have two lectures. I don't know if you noticed that on our topic outline. You notice that on Saturdays, we have an a.m. meeting and a p.m. meeting. And the reason why we're going to have Saturday morning meetings is we've learned that this Saturday is the Sabbath. So if you'd like to come and celebrate Sabbath with us, we're going to do that right here at FTC Tower, and that'll be at 10 o'clock. We'll take some time for questions first, and we'll probably have singing. And then at a probably close to 11, maybe quarter 11 or so, we'll have our topic. And the topic this Saturday morning will be the three steps to heaven. I'll share with you in that study how to live the victorious Christian life, how to stop smoking or drinking or gossiping <laughs> or getting angry or whatever you're struggling with. We'll look at the three steps to heaven, and in that, I'll give you the five keys to victory. That's this coming Saturday morning. So join us Saturday morning. Then, of course, we'll have a meeting in the, after, in the evening like we normally do at 6 o'clock. But this Saturday, starting this Saturday, we're going to have morning meetings. We invite you to come and worship with us. It'll be pretty much the same format as we're having in the evening. We'll have a morning lecture. Let's stand now and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Stand with us, please, as we sing this. If you're watching in another venue, you can stand also. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, adoring His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can turn our eyes upon Jesus. We want to do that now as you've brought us here safely to this place to study the Bible. Speak peace and hope to each heart. Bless those that are watching on television or the internet. Now as we open the Bible, open our minds to understand the truth, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, UFOs, the occult, and Christ's coming. In recent years, there's been a surge of renewed interest in the topic of UFOs. In fact, some time ago, Life magazine had a cover article entitled, UFOs, Why Do We Believe? The article revealed some interesting statistics. Over 16 million Americans claim to have seen a UFO. This was back in the year 2000. 2.7 million Americans say they've met an alien from another planet. Wow, there's an awful lot of aliens visiting, at least visiting in America. And back in 1999, there were 2,416 UFO sightings. The article also showed that 43% of Americans claim that UFOs are real, and 30% believe aliens have visited planet Earth. Seems like there's an awful lot of alien visitors, at least visiting America. Some time ago, the United States government did a major study on the topic of UFOs. In fact, the study spanned about 50 years. They concluded their study by stating that about 90% of UFO sightings actually turned out to be tangible objects. A bird, a balloon, a zeppelin, or some other flying craft. In fact, they're making airplanes these days that almost look like UFOs. 
And if you didn't know what that was, it flew over. You'd think, what, was that a UFO or what was that? But then there is the other 10% that are unidentifiable. And this is what has created all the UFO phenomena and interest that continues to percolate in society. In fact, back in 2001, a military pilot flying over Budapest, Hungary, photographed this object that certainly looks like a UFO. This is he over in Hungary. Here are UFO sightings by country. You can see the darker the color, the more sightings. And it's amazing that America seems to be the world leader in UFO sightings, followed by England, and then South America, Brazil, and other countries. You notice that over here where we are in the Philippines, not much UFO activity here. And that's actually good. We're going to find that out tonight. One researcher, an independent researcher who studied UFOs, said that they fall into two classes. One class is what he calls a hard class. This is sort of a metallic type object, usually saucer shaped or cigar shaped. The other class is what is called a soft class. This is more of a light formation or a gaseous formation or a cloud formation. You might have heard it was a couple months ago. They had that light, UFO light, over the Dome of the Rock Mosque. In fact, they actually videoed that. It's on YouTube. You can watch it on, I've seen the, the, the YouTube movie. And what's amazing, the vast majority of the UFO sightings fall into the second class, the soft class. Sometimes people that see a UFO in this class say, what I saw seemed to be alive. And sometimes it would split in two and fly off in opposite directions. Soft class. Another researcher who spent seven years studying UFOs for the United States government had this to say. We, quote, we don't really have evidence whether or not flying saucer beings have communicated with human beings. So he says we don't have any real concrete evidence. But... The interesting th thing that we have discovered is that whenever anybody claims they have had an encounter, the message seems to be always the same. What is the message coming from the UFOs? Here it is. War must stop. Peace must come. Don't you like that message? Isn't that an appealing message to a world that's plagued by war? Seems like there's war happening everywhere all the time. But wait, could it be that some supernatural power is seeking to deceive us with this appealing message? Could it be that some evil mastermind is seeking to mislead humanity and is using UFOs to carry an appealing message? The answer is yes, as we shall discover tonight. It's not our object to look into all the aspects of the flying saucer phenomena. But there are a couple questions we want to consider. First of all, does the UFO phenomena that's so popular in our world today, can it be harmonized with the Bible? Does it fit with the Bible? The answer is no. Second question. Does the UFO phenomena that's so popular in our world today, does it harmonize with the occult? Can you connect it with the occult world? And the answer, amazingly, is yes. Researchers have discovered a direct link between UFOs and the occult. In fact, they have discovered that whenever there's an increase of interest in society and occult science, psychic phenomena, astrology, the paranormal, that sort of thing, there is always a parallel increase of interest in UFOs, and there's always an increase of UFO sightings. So when there's an increase in society's interest in the paranormal, occult, and so forth, then there's always an increase of UFO sightings. By the way, did you know that in 2009, there was a 300% increase of UFO sightings over 2008? Why? What's society interested in these days? Stuff like Harry Potter 
And now we have the twilight zone and other stuff, paranormal stuff. We're interested in the occult in extra sense. We're interested in out powers outside of ourselves. And as a result, there's this huge increase of interest in UFOs and an increase of UFO sightings in society. And that brings us to some other questions. What are the psychics? What are the occultists? What are those that uh, believe in the paranormal? What do they have to say about UFOs? Do they believe in UFOs? Now, I ought to mention the psychics, the occultists, they don't believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. It's just another book among other books. They don't believe that Jesus is coming back literally in the clouds of heaven. They don't believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God. But many psychics and occultists believe in UFOs. In fact, research shows that about 90% of psychics and occultists believe in UFOs. Let me give you some examples. Here's one from Cybalik, an English a psychic, who said aliens from outer space will visit our planet with a message of peace. Another psychic said, Olaf Johnson, Contact between them and us, that's the flying saucer beings and us, will accomplish the good of mankind. Another psychic said, George King, beings, quote, via UFOs will bring world peace, end of quote. Question, will world peace be brought by the UFOs or will it be brought by the Prince of Peace, Jesus? Well, I'll let you decide. But of course, the psychics, the occultists, they believe UFOs are going to bring us world peace. I was presenting this topic of UFOs some years ago in a, another country. And I had a man come up to me after the meeting. He was not very happy with what I had shared about UFOs. But he told me that he had been abducted by aliens and, and taken in a UFO to another planet where he'd been healed of a disease. So you can imagine, he, he, he really believed in UFOs. He was an avid UFO enthusiast because he had been taken off to this other place and healed of a disease. Now, I don't question that man's story. No doubt he visited that other planet in probably in vision. But the question is, who took him there? Did you know the devil can transport people places? The devil transported Jesus. You can read that in Matthew 4. He took him up onto a mountaintop. Whether the devil took him up there in a UFO or not, we're not told. But one thing we do know, the devil can transport people places. So I don't question that young man's story. He was probably taken off to somewhere, I'm guessing in vision. But one thing I do know, that wasn't God or holy angels that carried him there because there is a direct link between UFOs and the occult. As I talked to that young man, I found out he was heavily involved in the occult. He didn't believe the Bible was God's inspired word. It was just another book among other books. In fact, he told me that he owned his own UFO in which he would travel during meditation. He told me, he said, Lowell, I could teach you how you could have your own UFO. I said, I'm not interested. <laughs> he was very much involved with the occult. And as a result, of course, he was involved with UFOs. I was doing this lecture on UFOs some years ago in Colorado. And I had a retired commander from Cheyenne Mountain attending my meetings. Cheyenne Mountain. Have you heard of Cheyenne Mountain? That's that underground city that's built right back into the mountain. Let me just, uh, here is how he describes Cheyenne Mountain. These are his own words. He was a retired commander from that complex. He said Cheyenne Mountain is the underground complex near Colorado Springs that serves as the nerve center for space and missile events around the globe, as well as air activities over Canada and the United States. It is the central command post for the North American Aerospace, Aerospace Defense Command, that's NORAD, and the United States Space Command, U.S. Spacecom. NORAD, U.S. Spacecom intelligence satellites orbiting at 36,200 kilometers above the Earth's surface provide 24-hour-a-day coverage of the entire Earth. Information from these and other satellites is transmitted to Cheyenne Mountain. 
for analysis and dissemination to the national command authorities at the Pentagon and the White House, as well as the national governments of allies around the world. So this is how he's describing Cheyenne Mountain. And then he says this. These are his own words I'm quoting. He said, quote, in my 20 plus years of having direct knowledge of information gathered by a multitude of the world's most highly sophisticated intelligence gathering satellites and ground-based sensors, nothing would lead me to believe that there is anything valid about the UFOs and extraterrestrial reports. This is what he says, a retired commander at Cheyenne Mountain. He said, quote, that's not to say that these things don't exist. I am merely saying that there is nothing that we can prove from a scientifically verifiable source that would either confirm or deny their existence. As a Christian military officer, I believe instead that these sightings are very sophisticated manifestations of Satan's deceptions, and I would agree with his conclusion. This retired commander from Cheyenne Mountain that had access to all that information coming in by the satellites and by the, by the radar and so forth, he says, I believe that these UFO sightings are very sophisticated manifestations of Satan's deceptions. There is a direct link between UFOs and the occult. The devil is seeking to deceive the world, and he's doing a pretty good job of it. He's deceiving multitudes today with UFOs. Now, I should mention, is the devil just trying to deceive the world? Or is he also trying to deceive people that believe in the Bible? He's also seeking to deceive people who can consider themselves Christians. He may not be able to deceive them with UFOs. He uses the UFOs primarily for those that don't really accept the Bible as God's divine word. But he has other deceptions for people that profess to be Christians. For example, you suppose before Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven, you suppose the devil would come himself claiming to be Jesus returned to earth? You think he'd try a trick like that upon the world? Try to deceive Christians? You suppose? You have your Bible tonight? Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, our first text. 2 Corinthians eleven. Verse 14, and we're going to answer this question about the devil appearing at end time, claiming to be Jesus returned to earth, trying to deceive Christians. I don't know whether you'll come in a UFO or not, but anyway. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, we have the page there if you're using the seminar Bible. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. have you found that place? If you're there, say yes. yes. Okay, let's read it. It says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into what? Into an angel of light. So he'll probably come someday claiming to be Jesus, looking like an angel of light to deceive Christians. Jesus warned us about deceptions concerning his return. Let's go read the warning from Matthew 24. Jesus said there would be counterfeits concerning his return. Matthew 24, we're going to read verses 23 through 27. And when you get to Matthew 24, you should have a ribbon in your Bible. Put your ribbon here in Matthew 24. Because we're going to re return to this place several times this evening. So take that ribbon that's in your Bible, or if you want to use a piece of paper or something, as Put a marker here in Matthew 24, because we're going to come back to this several times. Matthew 24, verses 23 through 27. Are you there? Let's begin with verse 23. Jesus says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, what does Jesus say? Believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive who? The very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For... 
as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus outlines here three general areas of deception. Deception about the person of Christ, false Christ coming, verse 24. There shall arise false Christ, false prophets. Then there would be deception about the place of Christ, here or there. Matthew 24, 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there. Believe it not. And then deception about the manner of Christ's coming. Secret. Verse 26. If they say he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it. Let's look at these three areas of deception. We'll take the first two together. Deception about the person of Christ and the place of Christ. Suppose you turn on your television some evening and the news anchor there is excitedly proclaiming, Jesus has come back to earth. He's come back to Manila. Or maybe he's come to Rome or Jerusalem. You see him there on television. This dazzling being looks just like the pictures of Jesus that we've seen. You see him healing the sick, maybe casting out the devils, maybe even appearing to raise the dead. You hear him speak some of the same words found in the Bible. You see thousands flocking to him. What would you do? You say, well, pastor, if he came to Manila, I'd have to buy a plane ticket and fly up there to meet him. Or if he came to Rome or Jerusalem, I'd have to buy a plane ticket to go over there because I, I would want to meet him. Would you? Oh, you might. If you didn't know how to spot the real Jesus from an imposter, will there be a message that will go out one day that Christ has come back to earth? Yes, Jesus said it would happen. Matthew 24, 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ. Christ is here or there. What's Jesus say? Don't believe it. In fact, he tells us not even to go see an imposter. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. That's, if he came to Jerusalem, that's sort of like desert. Jerusalem, sort of like desert. What's Jesus say? Go not forth. Why not? Because you might be deceived by his miracles, by his charisma. Jesus says, don't go. I have no question the devil will come someday as an angel of light. Jesus said false Christ would come. No doubt the devil, he'll be the greatest deception. And people will think this is Jesus. It'll look, the devil will look like Jesus. He'll talk like Jesus. He'll work miracles like Jesus. He'll have the scars in his hands and feet like Jesus. Oh, yes, we're already seeing that deception in the world. You might have heard of people that had the bleeding wounds in their hands and feet. We're already seeing that deception in the world. And when the devil comes claiming to be Jesus as an angel of light, the, almost the whole world will be deceived. That's why we need to know what the Bible teaches. So Jesus says there will be deception about the person of Christ, the place of Christ, but there would also be deception about the manner of his appearing. If they say it's going to be secret, then he says don't believe it. In fact, let's read it here, verse 26. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. If they say that there's something secret about Christ's return, what's Jesus say? Believe it not. There is, by the way, a popular teaching in some Christian communities, some churches today, that teaches that when Christ comes, it will be a secret event. We're going to see tonight that that's actually not what the Bible teaches. Jesus says, Matthew 24, verse 20, For as the, what? As the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Have you ever heard of secret lightning? <laughs> if it's secret, lightning, it's not lightning. <laughs> Christ's coming is not going to be a secret, and we're going to see that today. Four times in the book of Matthew, Matthew 24, Jesus warns his followers about deception concerning how he would come back. The devil is not just seeking to deceive the secular people. He's using UFOs to deceive much of the world, the secular world, and they don't believe in the Bible. 
But the devil also wants to deceive Christians, and that's why Jesus warns us in Matthew 24 about how he will come back. There's only one way that we're going to keep from being deceived. And what's that? We need to know what the Bible teaches about how Jesus will return. And so we're going to look at that this evening. Jesus knowing that the devil would seek to deceive people about his Christ's return, he's given us the exact details in the Bible. And I might mention God is not going to allow the devil to duplicate the manner of Christ's return. The devil will duplicate the person of Christ. Jesus said false Christ would come. And the Bible says he's going to come as an angel of light, the devil will. But God is not going to allow the devil to duplicate the manner of Christ's coming. So what is the manner of his coming? We're going to find out tonight. Christ's return is one of the greatest themes of the Bible. Jesus said in John 14, 1 to 3, what did he say? Read with me. Let not your heart be troubled. I will come again. That is the hope of the people that believe in the Bible. The hope of the Christian. Jesus will come back. It's been estimated that Christ's return is mentioned over 2,500 times in the Bible. Eight times more than his first coming. It's the great theme of Scripture. Paul said in Titus 2 verse 13 that he was looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice that word glorious, not the secret appearing, but the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. So how will Jesus come back? Tonight I'm going to give you five Bible facts concerning how Jesus will return. And I invite you to mark these in your notes today. You should have a notepad. I think they gave you a piece of paper as you came in. So mark down these five Bible facts about how Jesus will come back. If you have these five facts in mind, you will not be deceived by an imposter. So what are the five facts? Fact number one. The Bible teaches us Christ's coming will be a literal event. Fact number one, the Bible teaches Christ's coming will be a literal event. Did you know there's at least one church that teaches that Jesus has already come back? They say he came back back in 1914 or 1918 or something like that. And they say that Jesus is already here by his spiritual presence. Well, is Christ coming simply going to be a spiritual presence or is it going to be a literal event? Let's find the answer from the Bible. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I hope you left your marker in Matthew. We're going to return to Matthew. But let's go to Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. We have the page there if you're using the Seminar Bible. Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. This is the description of Christ's ascension. After he died and rose again, later he ascended back to heaven from the Mount of Olives. And we have the description of that here. Acts 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, verse 9, And when he, that Jesus, had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he went up into what? Into a cloud. Remember that. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. No doubt these two men would be angels. Which said, verse 11, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, not an imposter, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come how? In like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So he's going to come back as he went up. Question, how did Jesus go up? Did he suddenly just disappear and leave his robe in a crumpled pile at the disciples' feet? Some people call that the secret rapture. They say, you know, you're just, people are just going to disappear, vanish. Their glasses will fall, their clothes will fall, they'll just vanish. Is that how Jesus went up? Did he just vanish? No, they watched him go up. And he's going to come back how? In like manner. Now question, when Jesus went up into that cloud, was that a real Jesus or was it just some sort of spiritual presence? Was that a real Jesus that went up? 
That was a real Jesus. If you'd like to know how real he was, put in your notes Luke 24, verses 36 to 39. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, and he told the disciples, the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. After his resurrection, he had flesh and bones. A glorified flesh and bones, not subject to disease or aches or pains or aging. The same kind of flesh and bones that we will receive one day when Jesus comes back. And it was with that glorified body, flesh and bone body, he went up to heaven. Verse 51 told us, tells us. So it was a real Jesus that went up and he's coming back how? In like manner. So fact number one, Christ's coming will be a literal event. It will be a literal event. Let's read again verses 9 through 11 of Acts 1. And I want to underscore certain words here. While they, what? Beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven. What do these four words tell us? Did the disciples see Jesus go up? Yes. And he's coming back in like manner. So will we see him come back? Yes. That brings us to fact number two. The Bible teaches Christ's coming will be a visible event. Fact number one, it's going to be a literal event. Fact number two, it's going to be a visible event. How visible? Let's go back to Matthew 24. I hope you still have your marker, your ribbon there. Matthew 24. Turn back there, please. Matthew 24, verse 27. It says, For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Can you see lightning? You can see lightning even with your eyes closed. If you don't believe that, try it some night. Don't go outside when the lightning's flashing. But stand by the window, close your eyes, and see if you can tell when the lightning flashes. The lightning is so bright, you can see it even with your eyes closed. When I was a little boy, we used to have these lightning storms in Ohio where I grew up. And I would lay in my bed. I loved the lightning storms. I would lay in my, I'd close my eyes to see if I could still tell the lightning when it flashed. I could still see the lightning. I'd put a pillow over my face. I could still see the lightning was so bright. <laughs> Christ's coming is going to be as visible as the lightning. It will be a visible event. Another text. Revelation 1, verse 7. This is the last book of the Bible. If you need the page, we have it there. Revelation 1, verse 7. We're talking about how Christ's coming will be a visible event. Revelation 1, verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Well, shouldn't he? He went up in a cloud. He's coming back in like manner. So here, Revelation says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. And how many eyes will see him? Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So Jesus, when he comes back, how many eyes will see him? The Bible says every eye shall see him. You won't even need your glasses for that event. I believe every living person will see Jesus when he comes back. Even the eyes of the blind will be open for that event. Some of you are thinking, well, I thought, Pastor, I thought only the righteous would see Jesus when he comes back. Well, let's go back to Matthew. You have your marker there. Matthew 24. We're going to read verses 30 and 31 now. Matthew 24. There it is. There's the page if you didn't put your marker there. Matthew 24, 30 and 31. It says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall how many? All the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. By the way, they mourn not because they, they, their friends disappear. Not because the righteous suddenly vanish and leave their glasses and clothes in a pile. That's not why they mourn. They mourn because they're not ready. 
All tribes see this event. They're going to mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather. Here's the rapture. You might have heard the word rapture. That's the catching away of the saints. They, he, and the angels shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. The four winds, that's north, south, east, west. Notice the gathering of the elect, the rapture that is, takes place when every eye shall see him. That's when the righteous are gathered to meet the Lord in the air. People ask me sometimes, Pastor, do you believe in the rapture? I say, yes, I believe in the rapture. But the Bible does not teach a secret rapture. The rapture is not going to be a secret at all. How many eyes are going to see him? Every eye shall see him. And the, right, the wicked, they mourn, not because the righteous suddenly vanish. They mourn because they also see Jesus, but they're not ready for the event. Jesus is not coming quietly to some distant city. Not going to step out of a UFO somewhere. In fact, if you have to be told that Jesus has come back, if you have to read about it in the newspaper or hear it on the radio or see it on television, what do you know? Is that the real Jesus? No, that cannot be the real Jesus because when the real Jesus comes, how many eyes will see him? Every eye shall. Let's read it. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Fact, let me just back up and mention. People say, how could that be possible? Every, we live in a round world. How could every eye see Jesus? I say, I don't know. I know this. We all see the sun as the earth rotates on its axis. All Jesus would have to do is make one pass around the world... And we would all see him. The Bible does not say we're all see him at the same moment. We might. But I know this. How it happens, I don't know. But I know this. When Jesus comes, every eye shall see him. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. I believe the Bible, don't you? Fact number one, Christ's coming is going to be a literal event. Fact number two, it's going to be a visible event. Where did we find those two facts? Base your faith on the Bible. Let's go to fact number three. The Bible teaches us Christ's return will be a dramatic audible event. It will be an audible event. Let me give you a text. This is Psalms 50, verse 3. Psalms 50 verse 3 says, Our God shall come and shall keep silence. Uh, oh, did I miss something? What a difference one little word will make. Let me try that again. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour air. If Jesus comes walking this earth somewhere as a dazzling being, what do you know? That's not the real Jesus. Because when the real Jesus comes, we go up to meet him in the air. Christ has come to fulfill the promise of John 14, 1 through 3. Read with me. Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where is he today? He's up in heaven. So when he comes back, we're going to go up and meet him in the air, and he's going to take us to where? To those mansions that he's prepared for us. Let's go to our next fact. Fact number four, the Bible teaches us Christ's coming will be a, a climactic event. Here is the text. Revelation 16, verses 18 and 20. And I'd like to actually begin reading with verse 15. It's not on the screen, but you can put it in your notes if you like. Revelation 16. We'll start with verse 15. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, Jesus says. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So Christ's coming as a thief. When he arrives, what happens? Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders.
and sinks the islands. Now, by the way, we in the Philippines, we don't have to worry as long as we've accepted Jesus because those who have accepted Jesus, they're going to be doing what? They're going to be going up to, to meet the Lord in the air. So when the islands are sinking, that's no problem for those that have accepted Jesus. They're on the way up while the islands are on the way down. <laughs> Every island is fled away. The mountains are not found. Can you imagine the catastrophic event when Christ comes back? It will be a climactic event. We know this. The devil would have to have the, the cooperation of all nature to duplicate the real manner of Christ's coming. You'll know it's not the real Jesus unless you feel the ground shaking beneath your feet. You see the islands sinking, the mountains falling, and you can look up and you see Jesus coming back. Everybody else is looking up. Every eye shall see him. If that's not all happening, you know it's not the real Jesus. It's going to be a climactic event. Let's go to our fifth fact, fact number five. Fact number five, Christ coming, the Bible tells us, will be a glorious event. How glorious will it be? Let's go to Matthew 25, verse 31. You have your marker in Matthew 24. So just take a hold of your ribbon in your Bible and turn to Matthew 24. And then the very next page probably will be Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 31. Jesus says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So when Christ comes back, how many angels are coming with him? All the angels. How many angels are there? <laughs> Revelation 5.11 says there's 10,000 times 10,000. How many is that? That's 100 million. And then it says in thousands of thousands. So you take 100 million, multiply that by 1,000, Take that answer, multiply by another thousand, and you're getting close. Imagine the glory of a million billion angels. You'll know it's not the real Jesus unless that's all happening. Let's review what we've learned from the Bible about Christ's return, the manner of his return. Fact number one, Christ's coming will be a, it'll be a literal event. Fact number two, it's going to be a, a visible event. Number three, it will be a, an audible event. Number four, it will be a, a climactic event. And number five, a glorious event. Some of you are thinking, Pastor, I thought that Christ's coming would be as a thief. Doesn't the Bible teach that Christ's coming is as a thief? Yes, it actually teaches that. Let's read it from first, or second Peter, rather, second Peter 3, verse 10. Mark this in your notes. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord. Notice it's not the Lord, it's the day of the Lord. You can read the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 to 4. The day of the Lord comes as a thief. So here 2 Peter says, 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a what? As a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Does that sound like a secret event? The earth passes away, the earthquake and the tsunamis, does that sound like a secret event? Hardly. But notice it says the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Christ's coming will be a thief in timing, not in manner. How does a thief come? Does a thief call you up and say, hello, this is Mr. Thief calling. I'm going to be there at midnight tonight. You better be waiting. <laughs> How does a thief come? Unexpectedly. He comes as a surprise. And so Christ's coming is going to be unexpected. It's going to catch the world by surprise. But when Jesus arrives, the mountains are going to sink, the islands are going to sink. It's going to be a cataclysmic event. Not going to be a secret event at all. It'll be a thief in timing, not in manner. Think about this in Noah's day. How did the flood come in Noah's day? Did it come as a surprise? Yes, it was a surprise. Even though Noah had warned the world, the flood came as a surprise. What about those that were not ready for the flood? They experienced a seven-year tribulation. 
Have you heard about a seven-year tribulation? There's some Christians say, well, Christ is going to come back, and then after that will be a seven-year tribulation. Hmm. What happened in Noah's day? Did the wicked have a seven-year tribulation in Noah's day after the door closed on the ark? No. In Noah's day, those that were outside, what happened to them? They drowned, and Jesus said... Matthew 24, 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You say, Pastor, doesn't the Bible say one will be taken and one will be left? How many of you have heard of that theory? Let me see your hands. All right, looks like many of you have. By the way, it's in the Bible. But according to the theory, the one that's taken, who's that? That's the righteous. The one that's left behind, who's that? That's the wicked, the sinner. Question. Those that are left behind, are they left dead or alive? Let's find out from Jesus. Come with me to Luke 17. Luke 17, 26 to 37. We won't read all of that, but you can mark it in your notes if you like. Luke 17, 26 through 37. We'll start with verses 26 and 7. Luke 17... 26 and 7, Jesus speaking. It says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. In Noah's day, there were two groups. One group was taken into the ark and saved. What happened to those who were left behind? left outside. They drowned. One group saved, the other group destroyed. Reading on, verses 28 and 9, Jesus says, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You might have heard about the story of Sodom, how God destroyed Sodom. In Lot's day, in Sodom's day, two groups. One group taken out of Sodom and saved. What happened to those that were left in Sodom? They were destroyed. Two groups. One group saved, the other group destroyed. Verse 30 now. Luke 17, 30, Jesus says, Even thus, that means in the same way, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Two groups. Now let's go down to verse 34. Jesus says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left, left behind. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left, left behind. Two men, verse 36, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left, left behind. Verse 37, and they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? They knew where the righteous were going to go, but those that are left behind, where will they be left? Well, let's read it here. And they answering said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Where the body is, thither or there will the eagles also be gathered together. So those that are left behind after Jesus comes back are going to be left for what? For the eagles to eat. There is a very popular Christian novel series in America today called Left Behind. You might have heard about it. Describing in graphic detail the adventures of the, uh, the lost, the, those that weren't ready when Christ came, how they live, uh, according to the novel series, how they live on earth during this tribulation. That's not what the Bible teaches. That might be good for Christian novels. Great way to sell books. But it's not the teaching of truth from the Bible. Jesus says those that are left behind when Christ comes back are left for what? For the eagles to eat. If you want a cross-reference, Matthew 24, 28, wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So, what happens to the wicked when Christ comes back? 
I know this is a tragic picture, but we need to look at it from the Bible. This is from the book of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Here's Jesus coming back with his angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This would be the wicked. Who shall be punished with what? With a seven-year tribulation. Is that what it says? No, that's not what the Bible says. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Another text. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Put it in your notes. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the wicked, when Christ comes back, what happens to them? They are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. You don't want to be among the wicked when Christ comes back. When Jesus returns, there will be two groups. The saved, the righteous, they'll be taken up to heaven, taken up to meet the Lord in the air, taken up to those mansions. Now, by the way, let me back up and mention, if you want, one other text showing what happens to the wicked. Revelation 6, verses 14 through 17. How the wicked, they run away from Jesus. They pray for the mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them. So there are two groups. The righteous taken up to heaven, the wicked will be destroyed when Christ comes back. I trust the righteous, that's all you here, and those of you that are watching, we want to be among those that are going up to meet the Lord in the air, not those that are left behind for the eagles to eat. So let's review. We've learned that Christ's coming will be a literal event, a visible event, an audible event, a climactic event. And a glorious event, it will not be a secret event. No secret rapture. There will be a rapture, yes. That's the gathering, the catching away of the saints. But the Bible does not teach a secret rapture. It will be a glorious rapture. Question, is there anything in life more important than being ready for Christ's coming? Since we don't get a second chance, if you wait until Jesus comes back to accept him as your Savior, it's too late. You don't get a second chance after that. Since now is the time, we ought to be making our decisions now. There is nothing more important in life than being ready for Christ's coming. We know that Christ's coming is what? It is near. All the signs indicate that. Soon Jesus will return. Where will you be? What will you be doing when the ground begins to shake beneath your feet? That great earthquake. And you see the mountains falling and the islands sinking. And you look off in the distance, you see that spot of glory as Jesus with all the angels approaches the earth. And I can imagine as he gets closer, it seems that the whole heavens are filled with shining angels, clouds of angels, if you please. Millions, billions of angels. And then you look up, you see the face of Jesus, probably shining brighter than the sun. Every eye shall see him, the Bible says. He sounds the trumpet. The dead in Christ rise. That's the resurrection. We'll talk about the resurrection, by the way, in one of our future lectures. And then all the righteous will be what? Caught up to meet the Lord. Where? In the air. Taken up to those mansions that Christ has prepared for us. There to spend a thousand years in heaven. Where will you be, friend? Will you be there? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Do you want him to come back? I had a man tell me after this lecture, he said, oh, no, pastor, I don't want Jesus to come back. I said, why not? He said, I live on the ground floor of this big, tall apartment complex. And when that earthquake strikes, <laughs> it's all coming down on me. Yeah, I don't want Jesus to come back. I thought, how sad. If he's among the righteous, he's going to be going up to meet the Lord in the air. If he's among the wicked, he'll be praying for those falling buildings to fall on him and hide him from the face of Jesus. One or the other. Do you really want Jesus to come back? 
Imagine a young couple have gotten married. And the husband is a sailor. Shortly after the wedding, he heads off to sea. He's gone for months. But he writes home to his new bride. He writes these emails, these love letters. And every day, a new email from, from the ship. And the wife, she prints out these emails. She shows them to her friends, her family. She says, my husband, he's so thoughtful. He writes to me every day. I love him so much. I miss him so much. But I hope he doesn't come home too soon. <laughs> Would she say that if she really loved him? Have you ever heard a Christian with that attitude? We love you, Jesus. Oh, yes, we do, uh, but don't come too soon. <laughs> uh -oh. We got some things we want to enjoy down here first. Do you really want Jesus to come? He is coming soon, whether we are ready or not. I want to be ready, don't you? I want to be among those that are caught up to meet him in the air, taken up to those mansions that he's prepared. Whatever it takes, I want to be ready. How about you? Would you like to tell Jesus tonight, Lord, I want to be among those that are ready when you come back. How many want to tell him that? May I see your hand tonight? God bless you. We're going to end our meeting by singing this hymn, Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Let's stand as we sing this song. If you're watching in some other venue, stand with us. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ to die. Jesus Christ, to love me so, face to face shall I behold me, far beyond the starry sky. bow our heads as we pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious hope of Jesus soon coming. We're thankful for the truth in the Bible about how he will come back. We want to be among those that are ready, caught up to meet him in the air. We pray for our relatives, our family, our friends that have not yet accepted Jesus. Work in their lives. We want them to be with us. Bless each one who's here and each one who's watching. That when Jesus comes back, we might be among those saved. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night, remember, our meeting is at 6 o'clock. We'll be answering questions tomorrow. No health lecture. We'll take time for questions. And our topic tomorrow night will be the Antichrist cover-up. If you're using a seminar Bible, you can either leave it here on your chair or drop it off at the table on your way out. We'll see you back tomorrow night.